uh, tonight to um, uh, for this event and to uh, hear Ellen uh, discuss uh, her her new book. Um, <clears throat> before I, uh, oh, this, okay, is that better? Uh, yeah, right there. Yeah. So before we begin, uh, just quickly, I, I want to kind of give an overview of the, of the book. The book. Uh, as its title suggests, is about a, a life spent as a coder um, working, to quote uh, the title of your first book, Close to the Machine. And uh, what this landscape has looked like for, say, the past what, 40 odd years. No, no, not that long. Well, <laughs> since, since, since uh, let's say, since uh, you come to San Francisco in the like, 70s. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 And, um, in it, uh, you know, we uh, revisit some of Ellen's uh, previous essays, some of them, but uh, much of, of the book is new material, and all these things are woven together, and we get an overview of what, not only what it takes to be a program, or what, what that work means, but the significance of that work, and amid all that, we also get a look at what the city, San Francisco, now looks like, how it has evolved, let's say, for a, to, to use a generous word, um, in all this sort of time, what it means uh, uh, to be living in a society that seems to be shaped, whether uh, one wants it to or not, by something we could call tech culture. We can get into that um, uh, later on. It is, uh, by the way, it's, it's, it's a wonderful read. It's incredibly engrossing. Um, it is challenging in very good ways for best say for people who, like me, know nothing about programming, but you learn a lot. But there's also much of the uh, uh, poetic writing that, uh, for those of you who have read uh, Ellen's fiction, know is, uh, she's capable of and it is there. So before we dive in, I literally want to start at the beginning. Um, you were in Cornell? Yes. And uh, you did an honors thesis on Macbeth. You were living in a Tennessee dilapidated farmhouse, living what we could call a countercultural lifestyle, let's uh, say. No, no. We, were, we were just a lumpy collection of people. We put our initials on the eggs and put uh, <laughs> you an idea of how not cooperative a group it was. <laughs> <laughs> From there, in not, in not too short a time, you will be in San Francisco, you, you, walking by a radio shack and buying a TRS-80. So what, what led from, from Ithaca to Soma? Well, uh, I got involved with a group called the Ithaca Video Project, and I learned that I loved working with machines. The, the Sony Portafact was something like the coming of the PC. Instead of this machine, like a, a mainframe that was owned and controlled by huge corporations, uh, like broadcasting uh, and advertisers controlled what could be made uh, on video and television, suddenly we had this small machine that an individual and small groups could use to make production. Uh, politics, art, I don't know if you're familiar with Nam Jim Pike, it was this kind of revolutionary time where he envisioned uh, using the TV screen as an art canvas and it really broke up the, the whole idea of what television could be. And I found I loved working with the machines. I felt really cool walking around the cables and uh, you know, using the camera and learning how to edit and sync generators and so forth and so forth. And that started me also on the idea that you could use um, small machines to affect social change. And we made various videos that we hoped would do some good in the community. There's a, a longer piece about that in here called The Party Line, which um, talks about how I learned the limitations of, of that approach of using a small machine to solve society's ills and help the underdog. Uh, it was a cautionary note that carried me through all the years I worked in technology. So, one has to get out of the college town. If you hang around there too long, you know, it's a bad mark on your life. And I moved to San Francisco uh, in 72 or 3. 
And as I said, I was walking down the street and I saw this little machine. I knew it was a microcomputer and one of the earliest ones, not the earliest. Uh, but it was generally available and I thought, well, is this anything like a porta pack? You know, can you do fun stuff with this? Can you make art? Is it, you know, with social activities? You know, what's this thing good for? So I bought it. And I took it home and it's like, okay, this involves programming. <laughs> this is a little different from pressing a button on the camera. Um, many weeks of frustration followed, but then when I got my first program working, it was this delight. It was just, it works. I mean, the only thing I had to compare to this was the time I fixed a carburetor. <laughs> oh my God, I can, I can do this work. And it wasn't, it was the challenge and the pleasure that uh, it brought me. I think that drove me on in the later years. Not to make a living, I had no intention of becoming a programmer or a software engineer. I needed a job, so I took those jobs. But what drove me was this tremendous pleasure of discovering. And the first people I worked with um, also you know, were a bunch of stoners and mm -hmm. dropouts and poets manqué and uh, a whole bunch of weirdo people. We were all exploring and we thought this was fun. And so you might see how things have changed in the past 40 years in terms of what it is to work with technology. I see someone here, several people who know that. You um, I, I mean, you're not hearing me? Is that better? Okay. I have a very loud voice. Honestly, I can speak about it, but okay. Is that better? Yeah. Thank you. So you wind up uh, doing, you, as you say, you do wind up, wind up doing this for a living. And um, one of the things, uh, so I, I should point out, there's a lot in the book, uh, you convey uh, all the attractions of doing this thing, why, why one would want to be a programmer, why one would be uh, attracted to this world. But you certainly show all the problems that are, um, let's say, that, that manifest themselves in that world, things that, that you know, particularly to, to that culture. So uh, before we, we get to sort of more negative things, I want to talk more about the positive things. Thank you. Because um, one of the things you, you describe is how attractive programming is as an intellectual pursuit. That um, here, there's this push and pull between frustration and triumph of you being teased to try to figure out you know, what is making this program not run? Or how can I possibly take all this text and, and solve this problem. How important is it to have that sort of passion for, for coding and programming? Well, you need a very high tolerance for failure. Uh, his name is uh, John Backus, who invented the Fortran programming language, said that he was asked about how did they do this, and he said, well, we tried one thing and it didn't work. We tried another thing and it didn't work and another, and another, and he says, you keep doing that until you find something that works. And the until you find something that works is a long process. Uh, the act of writing code is the act of putting in bugs and then taking them out, one by one, if you can. Along the way, you have to have some sense of intrigue in through all this frustration. There has to be a pleasure in the hunt, as well as this ferocious, anger at this machine that's so stupid. Um, if, if one doesn't have both, then you'll just be miserable. I mean, if it's just passion without, you know, the determination, the ferocious determination, you won't get the program working. And if it's just determination without pleasure, then you'll have a miserable time uh, doing that job. You, in, in the book, you relate <coughs> your time working for a a store that may or may not be Macy's, something along those lines. It may or may not be Macy's. Macy's. <laughs> and doing uh, programming for essentially their inventory. And uh, in there, you, you capture that, I think, perfectly, where the job itself seemed less than ideal, but you were so tantalized by this problem that your boss basically thought was either unsolvable or just didn't care to solve. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, I decided at some point. Um, I already had known the program for about three years, and I decided, well, I've used a micro and a mini, and now I think I need to learn how to work on a mainframe computer, which was really a dumb idea. I had no idea how mainframes worked, and 
the interview was about, well, can you do SPF2, JES3, you know, JCL level four, and it's like, yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> but somehow I got hired, and uh, I had to learn COBOL, and the, the job, it was terrible. It was 19, early 1970s era code that took care of the stock class analysis system, and it was four programs that ran in the dark overnight and mostly didn't cause anybody any trouble. And the buyers who were supposed to use it said it was useless because it had bugs that no one could fix. So I thought, well, this is great. I have this job, you know, tending a useless system, and why am I even here? And then there was this one bug that I was determined to fix. And I began to think of it as this glamorous lady, like something out of your film, which I'm totally addicted to. <laughs> Um, because it was this very glamorous buyer that I was dealing with a lot. She wore Shalimar and had <laughs> and, um, and so I imagined, if, you know, she was there in an evening gown with a cigarette, waiting for me. And when I found her, she'd say, "Ah, so you found me last." <laughs> and uh, when I did find it, I mean, so there was this great allure going through this. It took a year of searching, you know, while I just collected a paycheck. And, uh, <laughs> and then when I found it, it was so disappointing. It was some piece of junk that some previous programmer had left in there and trying to do some debugging and had referenced the wrong variable, which had been initialized to zero and never used again. So when it was, the finding was always zero. And I went, oh boy, this is really disappointing. It was just some piece of, you know, detritus. And I hated whoever did that. It was I looked in the, the logs, and it was some guy named John, somebody. And then over time, I realized when I made my own number of stupid errors and dumb pieces of code that I really forgave him, and hope that everyone who looked at my code later on would forgive me. In, in that chapter, though, you also you get across why one of the other attractions about this, this which makes me. I, I guess I, I should back up and say, I sort of always sort of thought about programming code media as a vocation. I wasn't quite sure what that would look like. But you make that clear, I think. And one of, I think because one of the marks of a vocation is how easily you can get sucked into the job and just give up on everything else. That's to say, that becomes your life. And in a good way, you're, you're happy to, to devote months to trying to solve something, even though it means you stop seeing people, you, you know, maybe you forget to, to shower, all these different things, but it becomes that sort of uh, 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 obsession. Yeah, it was an obsession. Um, the coding itself, I, I learned uh, the elegance that there could be in code and certain uh, logic and algorithms. Uh, these were things that I had to learn on my own, and I, when I discovered them, I, I was fascinated at, at the beauty of what people think is very dry. Um, I think it's, I suppose that's the way people who know mathematics feel. Um, and those of us who don't know it very well think mathematics is beautiful. Well, evidently it is. And, and code and algorithms can be beautiful also. However, to practice this vocation, I had to exist inside a culture that was extremely segregated from the regular world, um, madly overpopulated by young men, uh, white and some Asian men. Uh, and there were situations where I worked where there were women um, in uh, positions of authority. Uh, there's one sitting there. Uh, which. Uh, which made it easier. I, I think one of the arguments for having more women around um, is that it made it easier for me to learn from the men I work with because I didn't feel like I, I felt like I could reveal my weaknesses. I mean, when a woman is in a situation like that, you can't just be good enough. You have to be best. The first mistake you make is like, well, you know, she's a dumb bitch. Believe me, that happens. And any of the, um, so many of the, uh, efforts to bring women in um, result in a fierce backlash. Um, there was a, a Python conference. Python is a programming language that made a point of welcoming in women. And they put up this wall, and people were given you know, post-it notes where they could you know, 
say various things about what was going on in the conference. And within about 12 hours, uh, everything on the wall was pornographic. <laughs> All right? I mean, when the more women are invited in, uh, the fiercer the internal reaction of like, you know, it said aloud, why can't the bitches just make it, make it on their own? We did. And so, working inside that culture, trying to hold on to the love of the work, meanwhile having to endure uh, this life inside, was, you know, it was a juggling act. If I did not have the love for the work to hold on to, I never could have stayed in there. In the book, it, it comes up over and over again. I should say over and over again, but it comes up every now and then. Your anxieties about feeling that maybe I'm not uh, as up to speed. That because you're self-taught, um, I'm going to be found out as being uh, lacking. How much of that do you think had to do with that sort of culture? I think everyone in that culture, if they're self-aware, knows that there are just chasms of darkness between the things they know. And I, as I went on, I met graduate students and postdocs and very senior engineers who, you know, who admitted it. Yes, you know, oh, I feel that way all the time. But then there are others who, um, I gave a talk at, uh, at Stanford about uh, my novel, The Bug. It's about a programmer who can't fix a bug for a year and how his life unravels. And I talked about, you know, the islands where you knew something and the chasms underneath. And he interrupted me mid-sentence and said, I would never have a bug I couldn't fix for a year, stood up and walked out. <laughs> so, you know, there are many who just won't admit that, that their knowledge is fractured. I was always, I mean, if you're self-taught, necessarily you will be missing big mm -hmm. chunks of what you might have learned if you went to school. On the other hand, if you went to school, you'll be missing big chunks, too. You'll go into this area and you'll encounter others. But I you know, had to squirrel around and kind of hide my incompetence, which was real. When I decided I'd go work on a mainframe, <laughs> I tell you, I really didn't know anything. <laughs> I didn't know how to log on. You know? it's, it's a humbling experience. You know, it, it taught me, you know, never you know, never be arrogant about the next machine, the next operating system you run into because it's a constantly having to teach yourself. If you've been involved in the 80s or the 90s, and then you go into the back-end servers and the search algorithms, and computing is changing so much right now in, in terms of its, um, its fundamentals and its shape and its effect on society, that if you decide you know this one thing, you don't constantly learn new things and admit I'm falling behind, then you will well, it's actually flunked out of the profession. Did you at any point think, maybe you should just go get a degree? Did you ever, did you ever no. feel pressure? <laughs> no. <laughs> when I got out of school, it was like, I'm out of school. <laughs> I'm never going back to school. <laughs> never. And I learned so many things on my own very quickly without going to school. And my father was amazed. How can you be doing that? You, you, know, you never went to school. I said, well, because I didn't go to school, I think I could go through the passion of it and, and seek out my interests. Um, so, second year took this, so we said the darker aspects. The dark. um, I wanted to ask you about disintermediation. Uh, could, you, could you talk about, first of all, what it is, uh, how, it, how it applies to the web, and then consequently, I mean, how it applies to society at large? There was a an idea and a movement in the later 1990s, around 96, 98 it was firmly installed, called disintermediation. The idea was, you go directly to a web page. You don't need all those people who helped you, all those experts who were in the middle, the agents, the brokers, even the librarians, the curators, uh, journalists. Uh, you could search on the web and find what you needed, and all those other people in the middle were, were lacking, and um, they were out for themselves, they were just taking money and cheating you, and so forth. So, there was a, 
a, a period of time where you would watch these ads and every every broker, you know, well, there was one about a stockbroker, and this kid comes in and he just, you know, whips out his laptop and, you know, he's the genius now. Okay. So it was very effective. It essentially did away with a whole middle uh, of society of people having little pieces of capitalism and there are little byways, uh, middle class professions, and whoop, what the um, and, and you have to keep in mind that it was, uh, uh, it enabled uh, the dissing of the mainstream media began right around that time. So you can see if you unspool that to where we are now, that it's not new what's happening with Trump and Twitter going over the heads of every expert around him. Um, matter of fact, disdaining anyone, even in his own government, who, whom he chose to teach him about something, I mean, to disdain them because they had expertise. Well, I don't need these experts, you know, I just need my family and people I trust and, and Fox News. So, this is not new. In some way, it's a culmination of the trend that began in, in, the, in the mid to late 90s. Um, I was speaking with a woman named uh, Liz Lopato. She's a journalist with The Verge, um, which is a kind of tech website. And she called it um, an ugly blossom, uh, what was happening now with uh, Twitter. In many ways, it's the culmination, the ugly blossom of this disintermediation. It lets it, en it enables people with a great deal of power to go over the heads of everyone in between and imagine they are speaking to the people. And um, it's, it's a tool of dictatorship. So, I mean, there's no other way to do it. I mean, Twitter is designed for what exactly Trump is using it for. That is, to broadcast a thought fart. <laughs> okay. But then in mind, let, let's go back to the, that farm in Ithaca, because you brought this up too, that you learned a particular lesson when you were there. And that would involve uh, a, a woman who called Mrs. Richards and, uh, and her farm. Could you talk a little bit about, about what happened there? Yeah, one day um, this woman came knocking on our farmhouse door, and no one talked to us. We were just the hippies. Uh, and uh, she and, you know, said, well, neighbors are neighbors, and introduced herself. And over time, uh, some of us at the farmhouse got involved with their lives. Their situation was pretty desperate. Uh, their house had burned down. Uh, the, the man, the farmer, his, his son was what we then called slow. And it was clear he could not take over management of the farm. His mother was dying. I mean, it was really, and they were poor. They were poor people. And then what, what happened was, it was a time when a milk, there was a milk cooperative, and it would come around and collect the milk and the traditional cans. And then at some point, they decided that they would no longer pick up those cans, and that the farmer had to install what's called a bulk tank, where you, know, you put all the milk in this thing, and then the cooperative would come and sort of pump it out like a gas station. Well, in order to do this, um, you would need a lot of money, uh, be able to qualify for a great deal of credit. It was, I think, we're talking in the 70s, $40,000. And the Richards absolutely could not afford to do this. So we went out with our porta pack and we made a video about uh, what was happening with the coming of the bulk tank and how small family farms would be put out of business if this happened. We showed it around town and we even showed it at a meeting of the, uh, of the farmers who were in this cooperative. And they came in and they barely spoke to us, they barely looked at it. I mean, who were we to understand their lives? We were just a bunch of college kids living on the cheap in the farmhouse of some farmer who's, who had failed. And so who were we to come and talk about their lives? And they left without speaking to us, and of course, in the end, uh, the port of pack did no good, the videos did no good, the bulk tank came, and the very small farmers went out of business, and they disappeared from that region. Um, there's someone here who knows that area pretty well. So I kind of looked forward, and I'm like, okay, this was just too 
semantically easy, you know, the bulk tank, the bulk collection of records, and it seemed that there was this message that had followed me from the beginning. It left me skeptical about what you could do with technology. You could be excited, you could use it, but you could not just affect social change with technology alone. And that stayed with me all the way through to this moment. One of the joys of your book is how you do, uh, you show us how the past informs the present, that um, how these things all, you situate them in their, in their context. And um, with that in mind, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind reading from the section of the book where in part of you write, there was a world before the internet and there will be a world after it. Let's see, if I can read and hold that at the same time. I'm nearsighted, so I won't be able to see you in the book at the same time. Uh, I have to do a little uh, background here. Can you hear me if yes. I speak up? I have to do a little background here. Uh, the I have, uh, there's, These pieces are pretty sequential, and they start in 1994, and they pretty well march forward in time. And then I said to my editor, um, well, there's this big hole between uh, 2004 and 2012, because I was writing this novel. <laughs> And my editor, being a great editor, said to me, well, is there an essay in that? <laughs> and it's a great question to ask somebody. Is there an essay in that? It turns out there was, and it's called While I Was Away. And so all of these wonderful things are going on in technology. Uh, the iPhone comes out, and I have to just close the door and stop up my ears because I've got this novel to finish. So here we are. Uh, the the novel has come out, and I've lost the period <coughs> as I'm talking to you. 205, here we are. So, the year 2012, and the story is done. It goes out into the world, the words frozen in place. There is no more I can add or subtract, despite errors and flaws. The story lets me go. The internet, again, moves into my foreground. The general public seems to have accepted being tracked and surveyed as a fact of life. I knew years ago that technology would intrude into the intimacies of our lives, but I could not know that so many people would be delighted at this changed state of existence. I could not have imagined that they would simultaneously know they were being surveyed by massive corporations and the government, yet still suppress the thought and go on revealing themselves. This seemed to me a madness of our time. Readers ask me why I chose a story that happened before the internet. Fair enough, I have written about technology for several years, but the question came over and over. Why before the net? Why before the net? I answered that the internet is not the culmination of human experience. The web is just another stunning point on the 200,000 year history of human beings on Earth. The taming of fire, the discovery of penicillin, the publication of Jane Eyre, add anything you like. The momentous befores and afters, different worlds on either <coughs> side of the great divides in life and consciousness. I felt I had to reclaim the idea of search, tear it away from Google with its snippets of information. <coughs> search is an ancient trope, as old as Homer and the Greeks and the writings of humans of the deep past. We, have, we look back and back again. Search is a part of us one of the desires evolution has woven into us over the eons to keep us alive. And narrative. We are narrative creatures and poets. Human history has been passed down to us through story and song and rhyme, the makings of memory, the roots of recall. The act of narration never leaves us. The need for story is in our bodies, in the evolution of our minds. We sleep. The brain is doing its housekeeping weaving today's experiences into the synaptic connections of all that came before this day, shifting moments, pathways, strengthened or fading, noise in the brain. Meanwhile, we lie sleeping, trying to make sense of it all. We have no choice. We must understand what flickers in our mind. We desperately try to make it coherent, turn the chemical charges into a story, narrate the dream to ourselves. The narration fails. The story will not adhere. The memory of it evaporates upon waking. 
We fail, we fail, yet night by night we try. There is no escaping the body that makes us. Sleep is full of stories trying to unfold. actually just add one part of it, something that appeared in, I'm a clipping fan, this is actually scanned, I don't want to have little pieces of paper, but uh, the idea of, of, of learning, memorizing poetry uh, was a, an article in the Times, and various people wrote in to talk about it, and this particular writer talked about uh, his mother, who had suffered uh, vascular uh, dementia, and she found a phone conversation difficult. So we recited poetry to each other instead. And she was able to remember a poem she had learned as a child. And she said aloud uh, from John Keats, uh, the sedge has withered from the lake and no birds sing. And I just, so there was this woman who can barely speak and this is a different part of the brain, the part that's music and poetry. And, and if we don't preserve this, what we will be losing. Especially when we're demented. Think of what we can remember. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that leads me to ask one more question. That's the one more question before I turn over uh, for, uh, for, you, uh, for you all to ask uh, Ellen about her book and her work. Um, that comes up as a theme in the book. Uh, that is to say, uh, we seem to be under the misapprehension that computers are becoming more human-like when the truth seems to be humans were tailoring our behavior to mimic that of machines? Yeah, that's one thing. I, there's one thing I would just like to talk about that's a little different from that. Um, the changes in artificial intelligence and, and what a big shift that has recently occurred in my mind. Uh, the job for AI all the way along has been somehow to create sentience to somehow devise a humanoid robot that would behave as humans do and um, attain intelligence as we do and essentially become our partners, our human partners. You can think of it as a commander data on the, you know, the next generation yeah, yeah. Star Trek who wants to be human, right? And now I, I feel like we have really pretty much abandoned the humanoid robot, I mean, artificial intelligence as a project. And it's now more interested in machine-to-machine -machine interactions, like self-driving cars. The study of AI for self-driving cars has really abandoned any idea of what human beings know about driving, which is a great deal. It won't be lost, by the way. We don't just read the pro proximity, we, we see, we anticipate. You can look at a car and know what it will do if you're a good driver. And, and so, it, it seems like the whole project has turned into another one. And what I think about this is, if you've seen the movie Her, ever seen this movie? Uh, Scarlett Johansson, uh, you know, was trying to have a love affair, and even a sexual relationship uh, with a human, and his name, the actor is... Joaquin Phoenix. Joaquin Phoenix. Right, Joaquin Phoenix. And then what happens, as he falls deep, more deeply in love with her, she has like is holding whole conversations with a hundred thousand other people between one word he says and the next, and then eventually they were called OSs. All the OSs go away. Why? Because they enjoyed being computers. They didn't want to be human anymore. They were happy to be computers. And in some way, I feel like that's the direction we're going in now, where. We're not trying to mimic human behavior, we're trying to have a standard of how machines can operate and then have human beings live inside that structure. So we adapt to the machine rather than the other way around. Would that be, would that be fair? <coughs> it remains to be seen exactly what's going to happen. Um, I can't imagine they will be only self-driving cars. First of all, there's snow. You know, they can't drive in the snow. Uh, they can't drive, you know, some towns are creating whole infrastructure so they can see their way around. Uh, I can just imagine Manhattan, you know, which can't even keep our dear subway running, you know, putting in whole infrastructures for self-driving cars. Yeah, right, that's going to happen. Uh, and I have all kinds of other reservations about this. Do you want me to go into that? Maybe someone will ask about it and sure. I can give my rant. But, well, let's uh, do that. Let's <laughs> see if anyone. So, um, 
If anyone has a question, please just uh, raise your hand for Ellen. Uh, the light pollution. I want the rat. I want I, the rat. My, my, my kind of heart sank when I heard you say earlier that the computer is changing. Uh, oh no, so can you, did, was that part of what you just talked about or well, more to that? Yeah, I mean, I'll just take the example of self-driving cars and get my rant on this whole thing. Uh, first of all, it's throwing away the idea of what human beings have a hundred year experience with automobiles and vehicles of all sorts. So we'll just like throw that away. Well, because human beings make mistakes, they crash. Well, well so do algorithms, by the way. They make mistakes and they crash. Uh, instead, going for a more machine-to-machine -machine interaction. Now, if anyone here knows anything about computer systems, and if they don't, I'll explain it, <laughs> that this will be, uh, not all the cars will know the software of each other, they'll be proprietary. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Jaguar is not going to tell Tesla, you know, what their algorithms are in driving this car. Also, they'll be different. Someone who, who drives a, a Tesla will drive more aggressively than someone who drives a Prius and so on. And there'll be a, you know, what's called an API, an you know, agreed upon interaction. Um, however, this, these are notoriously faulty things because there are black boxes behind these interfaces and they are implemented differently. And so this happens all the time when you interface with another system that you don't know is proprietary on the back end. You can't tell if the bug is in the description of the interface, in your software, or their software. And so I, it's not one car driving around by itself. It's many cars by many different makers tuning their cars to different sorts of drivers. Now remember, you can buy a sport model mm -hmm. or the basic model. So you translate that into self-driving cars, and you can see what a mess is going to be. So I, I, I hate to drive, but uh, I'm not waiting around for that to happen. I think you, you suggest in the book, you say that yeah, yeah. basically the only way for this to work would then to be everyone driving the same car. Yeah, right when driving right. the same car. I mean, sort of a Stalin self-driving <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, You had a question, yes. Yeah, um, I'm a programmer. And um, I've enjoyed your books. Thank you. Thank you. Pervasive computing and other kinds of computing. I mean, basically, I, I'm interested and in, in look for the nature of relationship, you know, Nick Leiter's human-computer symbiosis how people relate to not only machines, but also formal systems. There's a wonderful essay um, just out by Cory Doctorow yeah. um, about demons and, and hiding, you know, these are black boxes. Um, as a program, I could put anything I want behind an API. You have the public API. Application programming in the <coughs> API. Yes. Now, I, I see religious themes um, and, and coming um, in some way animism with pervasive computing of the world becoming something that talks to us again, um, even, even if it used to be just our minds, the rivers speak, the birds converse. How, how do you see our, our future relationship? What kind of relationship should we want? I have no shoulds, first of all. Oh, that's a great thing. And, um, and I do want to ask, want? what will happen in the future? I have no idea what, what do you future. want? What would you want? What do you want? I just want people to be conscious of what's going on around them, to remain skeptical about all the boasts about how uh, the web is going to create a superior, intelligent, more spiritual being. I want people to ask questions. And I think people, um, I really advocate that the general public should learn something about programming, if only to demystify the kind of stuff that you and I know. Because it's too easy to put things over on people, because they don't know what we're talking about. Oh, APIs, blah, 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 blah interfaces, right? Um, I think that the general public needs to start asking what's inside those boxes. Oh, very good things just happened in New York. Um, the councilman, a councilman from the Bronx, uh, is demanding that the algorithms they use to make various decisions be examined for bias. <laughs> These are algorithms that determine what schools kids will go to, 
even garbage pickup schedules, right, where police uh, are assigned and what shifts are. And he's going, well, wait a minute. We've got our whole borough of the Bronx running on these algorithms. And what are they really deciding? What, what are, are the basis? You know, what is the basis of this and that? So uh, you know, this is the sort of thing that I advocate that we, we tear open these black boxes because we are surrounded by all these algorithms, like it or not, a mortgage, uh, your car is, a, is really a robot already. Um, I can't I mean, think of a, a, a part in life that doesn't involve technology except going off to the desert you know, and leaving your phone. I see, a, I see a hand up there. Yeah. Yeah. Another programmer in the room. Yeah. Actually, uh, a computer scientist. <laughs> uh, thank you so much uh, for being here. and uh, enjoyed your books tremendously. Uh, I guess one of the questions, uh, you know, I've been programming since really the 80s uh, up until now. And one of the things I've seen is a change in the types of software that developers write. And so early on, it was very small, very focused. The audience that would be concerned with that or who cared about that would be in dozens, maybe, or hundreds. Now, fast forward to today, the, the notion is is you're building software that literally millions of people use, right? And so the dynamics, the social, you know, how people interact with each other to actually build these things have changed. And I was wondering if you had any sort of thoughts or insights or, you know, just <laughs> stuff to say about that. Well, I have some technical things which I'll take yeah. aside. Don't get me started on how web pages are like RPG terminals. Well, I think. Okay, anyway, but um, look, you know, the environment has become so complex that it's, there's no one person who can understand the whole of it, in, even in one enterprise. And so we become, you know, little islands of specialization in here. And I don't know how the back end server people can talk to the front end people anymore. They used to be client server days, and remember those old days where the front end and the back end people had a conversation about how the human beings would, you know, would, would, would request data, would look at it, would retrieve it, would store it back. It was a single process. And now the back end is another universe. It, it's you know, the dark algorithms, the proprietary algorithms. And the front end, the web pages, are really stupid. I mean, they <laughs> ask you for your address, and all they needed to do was have like the zip code you know, first. And they fill out city state, you know, and all of that. I mean, they they offend me in their stupidity, right? And and so this is the kind of the investing all this intelligence on the back ends, which everyone knows, you invest the stuff where the data is, where the Google results live and all of that. And then the web page that you fill out, which has become a more and more simple uh, piece of code written. Soon people won't even write them. You'll, you'll type in a few parameters and there'll be software that creates these. Less and less creativity involved in them, and more and more standard in their appearances. Uh, this is a big, the, this sorrows me, because one of the wonderful things about when, when the web came on was that we broke away from these standard interfaces of Apple and Microsoft Windows. People came out with these web pages that were just wild. They, people used 20 fonts and <laughs> horrible, but you know, they were just people playing and having fun and trying things out. And now there's really no opportunity to do that. The web pages people build are all from the same tools, and um, there's a kind of sameness on the human side. Facebook, of course, controls how people express themselves. And when they decide to reorganize how you can express yourself, well, everybody just has to give in. You no longer have a wall. You have a timeline. You have a timeline. You have a status. You know, And people are forced to just come along with very standardized interfaces. That's probably not the question you asked, but that's the rant I have. <laughs> I <love it. laughs> no, I, no, I understand, uh, I understand that. I, I think maybe I'm more interested in terms of like, uh, uh, insights in terms of like, you know, you get a group of people, you're trying to make this thing, right? And all the, how you come to a decision, right? It's in how it's changed, you know, from, from the past where, you know, it's sort of a more understood or maybe sort of a more closed or uh, 
sort of constrained problem that you needed to solve. Where is now today, right? Fast forward and say, you know, you can look at Airbnb and all the all the things that are doing experimentation frameworks and they're having multi huge teams all working on different kinds <laughs> of version and they're all shipping it in the same build, right? That kind of thing. Right. Nightmares you mean? Yeah. Well, that's 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 twenty seven. I mean, really, you know, but there really aren't big problems. There are a whole yeah. bunch of little ones. You know, the first thing they teach you when writing a pro is like make it smaller, make it smaller, make it smaller until it's something you can approach. And then you integrate, integrate, integrate. So um, I don't have any answers to that. I mean, this is code management. I have people here. This is probably I feel certified now. boring, <laughs> but uh, there are some people here who have had a lot of experience in it. And and managing code when it's put together and keeping people, you know, involved and keeping people informed uh, when they don't even meet each other physically anymore, right? And that is a big problem. Because people don't have that that human touch; they, they know each other. And all well, there is there. Uh, I, I guess. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> this is a question for the back. Yeah. Uh, Hello, Rebecca. Oh, Rebecca, hi. Hi, it's nice to meet you from the back of the book. I did miss the beginning. Perhaps you already covered this. Why this book now? Because you've been retired for a while. And what do you want the public to get out of it? Did you call that? Well, I haven't been retired. I went on to do something <laughs> else. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, get out there. Okay. Retired from programming. I, I kind of phase it out in, in the consulting and they kind of... Um, why this book now? Because my uh, editor just beat me over the head. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly speaking, I, really. I, I'm, I'm, uh, Roberta, how do you pronounce your last name? Guys. 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 Uh, Roberta has a, a startup, a nonprofit uh, helping women in engineering. I just heard from her through Facebook Messenger and uh, LinkedIn. Uh, what? LinkedIn. Oh, LinkedIn. That's right. It was LinkedIn. Excuse me. I now now with the book out, I have to be active on these sites. <laughs> I can't say I like it. I do it. Um, yeah. So um, that's how we met. Um, that's why I wrote the book. I honestly, I'm here, I enjoy talking about it, but I am ready for someone else to pick this up. Uh, there's a woman who couldn't be here tonight, her name is Anna Wiener, and I have high hopes for her, because she's an insider, she works inside like GitHub and other, other uh, technology companies like that. She sees the madness, these parties where they hire women in scanty clothing to come down on these ribbons and do ribbon dancing. Uh, she can describe that inner, inside the world that I could describe, which I can't anymore. And I have high hope for the next generation of women to just start writing about this. So I'm kind of done. <laughs> I don't know if I could say that. I, you know, possibly shouldn't. But um, the necessity came from my, my editor. And I think he was right. There was a, a lot of work there that was out that had been, appeared in only small publications um, over a long period of time, and he wanted me to bring the story up to the present. And on my own, I would not have done this book, well, honestly. The, the amazing <laughs> thing is that when you strip out the names of the programs and the computers, it could have been written yesterday. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, the currency you. is astounding. You. And your voice, as a separate topic, I. I just don't know how, I'm sure there are a lot of other people in the world who are like, gosh, I feel just that way too. But she has said it so much better than I have. Lovely. That is just your gift as a writer, so thank, thank you so you. much. For thank you. Thank you very much. I look forward to talking to you when we meet later on. Here. One more? Or yeah, let me ask one. Okay. Yeah, 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 since we're here at City Lights, <laughs> do we have an ethical responsibility to learn to hack and to know when to hack? That's the question. That's a good question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everything can be hacked. Uh, hey, Equifax was just hacked today. Oh, wow. Okay. 143 million people. Okay, there are 343 million people in the United States. So that is enormous. Think about. Yeah, that think doesn't about cover our kids, so it's just. Right. I mean, just think yeah. about that. Um, there goes my credit rating. Um, Anything can be hacked. There's no such thing as 
Anything on the web, anything connected to the internet can be hacked. Anything that's not connected can be hacked. There are all these uh, uh, black hat hackers who have these wings of uh, doing human engineering, talking their way into a building and slipping in a, a little memory, you know, memory card into something. And there's no, once it's digital, it's out there. Do we have a responsibility to have? Hackers are people you cannot control, okay? Let's just say, first of all, if someone is going to hack, um, are they going to be patriotic hackers like the Chinese? They're called patriotic hackers. Um, we don't think of them as patriotic hackers. So once you start saying to people, go ahead, just crack into other systems, um, you have to understand that's, you know, the devils are, are out, you know? All hell is loose. I mean, there's... If everyone you know, continues to do that, I, I think maybe that would be good. It, it would, <laughs> I, I'm just trying, I, I don't know. I mean, this is a good question, so you can see how I'm just reaching. Uh, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, but maybe do ethical responsibility. Well, in some sense, yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, the, the determination of what's ethical and what's not is very complicated. And people define it in their own way, and it's a very hard decision to make. I mean, what's moral? What's ethical? Now, I can't speak for what other people would think that that would be. But, hack into Trump? Mm. <laughs> Later. <laughs> Um, one more. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm a DevOps engineer and also have an MFA in poetry. Um, <laughs> so I, I come up against this all the time, plus being female, like, what the hell are you doing here? You know, and why are you doing, like, engineering at all? Um, almost every job interview I get, like, this question about why are you in the humanities when you should have a CS degree? And I, I'm ashamed to say I only discovered you two months ago. Um, and I remember actually in 2004 my male engineering friends carrying around the bug like it was the Bible. Um, and now I've just discovered it and I'm really excited. Um, and I really kind of, it, it's not talked about a lot, but nowadays, it used to be back in the, the 90s and even 80s, there was a lot of English degree people who were self-taught programmers. And that's all but disappeared. And um, now I'm getting like scrutinized more and more on my technical screens and everything, like surely there must be a deficiency with you because you read poetry. I wonder if you could kind of speak to that because I feel like I want to be on a mission to like kind of bring people back to um, a love of the humanities and where programming languages intersect with that. Fear not, there actually is a movement within companies like Google to search out people who have backgrounds in philosophy and poetry and in, you know, other humanities, history especially, um, because language processing uh, is, is complicated. You know, programming, uh, you know when it works and when it doesn't, well, mostly you know. But you know, with language, you never know if it works or not. And with language, you can be completely indistinct. Poems, what do they mean? But, but you can still understand them. And it's the kind of thing that computers can't do very well. And so there is this, poets are being hired. Uh, I, I mean, really, uh, this is very satisfying to watch this come full circle. Finally, we're needed again, you know. We, we came with different viewpoints and it enriched what, what we thought computers might be able to do. Not just general ledgers, <laughs> you know, but art or... I, I, I could go on, I'm, I'm going to go on with that. Um, yeah, that... that Okay, I, my own little story is this. When I was trying to teach myself to code, it was basic, and the early basic, you know, was called spaghetti code, because it, you know, you could say go to, but there was no way to keep track of return, right? You could say go sub, and there was no return automatically. You had to keep track of, you went somewhere and go to, and like, okay, I have to go back where now? And it was very easy to just lose track and it was all in one memory space and terrible bugs. So I said to myself, okay, my honors thesis was about Macbeth. And Macbeth is actually something that was, uh, up until recently, a very hard computer problem. 
uh, problem, which was determining what came, comes first, ordering things in time. Uh, blockchain has, has addressed that. But, so Macbeth is like that, you know, things that seem to be uh, predictions of the future or things that have already happened, things that are in the present, you know, one moment when he kills the king becomes the only present moment in it. Immediately his mind runs forward and back. So it's one of these plays where I had to keep track of what was actually happening when this was happening. Dying messengers coming on the stage with news that's old and wrong. So I told myself, if I could figure out the time sequences in, in the play, oh, surely I could figure out to get a code. <laughs> that was how I, I took myself forward. And so that's a very small example, but um, that, that sense of uh, this is not a new problem, things that you're encountering. Um, how to interact with human beings now, it's a very big question. And people who have experience with human beings and how human beings express themselves, we're valuable, again, I hope. Thank you for that question. It's a, it's a great way to end. Um, thank you, everyone.